you have your Bible with you this morning, please take it out and go over into your Old Testament to the book of Exodus, to Exodus, the 12th chapter. Please go in your Bible to Exodus chapter 12, and we're going to read verse number 12 in just a moment. As you turn there and get settled in, let me just say that it's good to see you this morning. It has certainly been a wonderful uh, day of worship so far. We've had a very encouraging period of worship and I'm just so thankful to be here with you this morning. Worship our God in spirit and in truth. May God bless you and bless your family. In Exodus, the 12th chapter, and in verse number 12, the Bible says this. It says, For I will go through the land of Egypt on that night, and will strike down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am. I am the Lord. Brothers and sisters, this verse right here, Exodus 12 and verse 12, is certainly a very intriguing verse in the sacred text. It's a very important verse in the book of Exodus. In fact, I want to begin this morning by submitting to you that understanding this verse right here it's absolutely critical to being able to fully understand and fully appreciate what God is doing when he sends the ten plagues upon the Egyptians. You see, here in the context of this verse, we need to understand that very soon God is about to unleash his final plague upon the Egyptians. Very soon God is about to kill Every firstborn throughout the land of Egypt, only his people, the Israelites, would be spared of this plague if they obeyed his very specific instructions. God knew that once this tenth plague was unleashed, Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, would be brought to his lowest point and he would finally give in and let his people go. He would finally realize and understand what God wanted him to understand. And that is the God of the Israelites was Jehovah. He was the one true and living God. And the gods of the Egyptians were absolutely nothing. They were fake. They were frauds. They were absolutely powerless when it came to helping those who worshiped them. You see, that is really the main thing, that these plagues were designed to help Pharaoh understand, and that's also the main thing that we need to understand. You see, in addition to bringing judgment on Pharaoh's kingdom and humbling him, we need to understand that the main reason why God brought these ten plagues upon the Egyptians was because he was going to expose something. He was going to expose the false gods of the Egyptians. He was going to expose the fact that their quote-unquote gods were really not gods at all. Instead, they were fake. They were frauds. They were imaginary. They were powerless when it came to helping the Egyptians. That was the main purpose behind the plagues. And for us to really be able to appreciate that and understand that, I think it is important that this morning for a few minutes that we consider some of the things that history tells us about the gods of the Egyptians. And so will you study that with me this morning? Will you study with me what history tells us about the gods of Egypt, and let's just begin by first pointing out that for a couple of thousand years, history tells us that the Egyptians worshipped many different gods. They worshipped many different gods. In fact, some scholars estimate that the Egyptians could have worshipped as many as 2,000 deities. They had gods all over the place. They had gods over essentially any and everything, they were some of the most religious people in the history of the world. The Egyptians worshipped many different gods, and their gods, according to what history tells us, were both male and female. 
For every male, quote unquote, God they had, they also had a female counterpart. They had male gods and they had female gods and their gods, according to their belief, looked and behaved just like us. They looked and behaved just like humans. By that I mean they could do the same things that, that we can do. They could marry. And, and they could procreate. They could have children. They could eat, sleep, farm, cook, clean, hunt, party, engage in sexual activity, and they could even die. The Egyptians believed that their quote-unquote gods looked and behaved just like humans, but not only do they believe that their gods behave like humans, fourthly, they also believed that their gods possessed animal qualities. In fact, in many of the ancient Egyptian drawings, you will usually find the Egyptians depicting their gods as being both half human and half animal. You ever noticed that before? Usually in their ancient drawings, they depicted their gods as having a human body with an animal head on them. They usually had a human body in the head of a frog or a crocodile or a bull or a cat or a goat or a bird. Animals were usually depicted as representing the Egyptian gods. Usually they, depict, they depicted their gods as being both half human and half animal. In fact, when it came to animals, animals themselves were, were viewed as sacred by the Egyptians. Animals were viewed as sacred because they were viewed as living images of their gods. In fact, in many cases in ancient Egypt, the people treated animals better than they treated one another. You see, if you were living in ancient Egypt and you happened to kill a frog or a bird or a cat or even a bull, it's very possible that during those times you would have faced the death penalty. You would have been killed for that offense because animals were revered and held in high esteem by the Egyptians. And you see, unlike what we believe as Christians, in ancient Egypt, the Egyptians believed that they needed to have a God to govern every aspect of life. Unlike us as Christians who believe in a one true and living God, the Egyptians believed that they had to have a God for essentially any and everything. They had to have a God for the sun. And they had to have a God for the moon and for the rain and for fertility and for crops and the earth and the stars and health and love and work and even the afterlife. The Egyptians believed they needed gods to govern nearly every aspect of their lives. And there were many fantastic myth stories that were created about their gods. These fantastic myth stories were created to exalt their gods and so, sh so show superiority of one god compared to another. In fact, the king of all of the gods of Egypt, according to their belief, was Amun-Ra. Amun-Ra, in ancient Egyptian art, Amun-Ra is usually depicted like this right here. He's usually depicted as having a falcon head with a solar disk above his head. The solar disk above his head represents the fact that they believed he was the sun god. He was the chief god. He was the main god. All of the other quote-unquote gods were under him and they served him. Now, these are just a few important things. There are many other things I could say about this, but these are just a few important things that we need to understand about the gods of the Egyptians if we're really going to get what God wants us to get out of this biblical narrative. If we're really going to get and appreciate what God wants us to get out of the story of the ten plagues, then it is important that we understand that during this time, the Egyptians had many different gods that they worshipped. They had many gods that they believed in. They had many gods that they served. And the one true and living God, he was going to expose them. 
He was going to bring judgment upon them. God says against all of the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. God is going to execute judgment against the gods of the Egyptians. And we see him doing this as early as the first plague. Go in your Bible to Exodus chapter 7, please. Go in your Bible to Exodus 7. I want to start reading with verse number 14. And as you turn to Exodus 7, let me just say that I'm about to go through some things very quickly, hopefully very quickly in the next few minutes. And so if you have a tough time keeping up with some of the things I'm about to say, please make sure you get a copy of the outline. Download the outline on the website today because I'm going to go through uh, some things very quickly, and if you don't have on your spiritual track shoes this morning, it's going to be hard for you to, to keep up with some of these things. So in Exodus 7, beginning with verse number 14, the Bible says in verse 14, Then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is stubborn. He refuses to let the people go. Go to Pharaoh in the morning as he is going out to the water, and station yourself to meet him on the bank of the Nile. You shall take in your hand the staff that was turned into a serpent. You shall go to him. You shall say to him, I'm sorry, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, sent me to you saying, let my people go that they may serve me in the wilderness. But behold, you have not listened until now. Thus says the Lord, by this you should know that I am the Lord. Behold, I will strike the water that is in the Nile with the staff that is in my hand and it will be turned to blood. The fish that are in the Nile will die, and the Nile will become foul, and the Egyptians will find difficulty in drinking water from the Nile. Then the Lord God said to Moses, Say to Aaron, Stretch your staff and stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt, over the rivers, over their streams, and over their pools, and over all the reservoirs of water, that they may become blood and there will be blood throughout all of the land of Egypt, both in vessels of wood and in vessels of stone. Verse 20, so Moses and Aaron did as the Lord had commanded. And he lifted up the staff and struck the water that was in the Nile, in the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of the servants. And all the water that was in the Nile was turned to blood. The fish that were in the Nile died, and the Nile became foul so that the Egyptians could not drink water from the Nile, and the blood was through all the land of Egypt. Brothers and sisters, I want you to notice the first wonder, or the first plague that God brought upon the Egyptians. Do you see that? Notice how the first plague that God brought upon the Egyptians it involved him turning the Nile River, that is the main source of their prosperity, that is the main river that they needed to survive. God turned the Nile River into a river of blood. He turned the main source of their prosperity into a river of blood, so much so that everything in it died and no one could drink from it. God turned the Nile River into a river of blood, and that miracle was a shot at at least three of their gods. First, it was a shot at the Egyptian god Kunum. Kunum was said to have been the god who was supposed to protect the Nile River. It was also a shot at the god Happy. Happy was supposed to be the god of annual flooding, and it was also a shot at the god Osiris. Osiris was said to be the god of, of the afterlife, and the Nile River was supposed to be his bloodstream. All three of these quote-unquote gods were said to have had a connection, a direct connection to the Nile River, and yet none of them could protect it. None of them could save it. None of them could prevent the Nile River from turning into blood. And so God exposed these false gods of the Egyptians when he turned the Nile River into blood. But after God turned the Nile River into blood, the second plague that he brought upon the Egyptians had to do with one of my greatest fears, and it is frogs. Frogs. 
I hate frogs. Do you hate frogs? I hate frogs. I hate big frogs, little frogs, green frogs, brown frogs. I hate all kinds of frogs. And God sent frogs throughout all of the land of Egypt. Frogs were everywhere in Egypt. And this is a particularly interesting plague because to the Egyptian people during this time, the frog to them represented the goddess Heket. Heket, you see, Heket was said to be the goddess of fertility and birth. Heket was supposed to be the god who protected the Egyptian women whenever they gave birth to their children. Whenever an Egyptian saw a frog during this time, they usually thought of the goddess Heket because Heket, to them, the frog was her, was her symbol. People thought of Heket whenever they saw a frog, but notice how on this occasion, Heket was exposed. Heket couldn't stop the frogs from doing anything. She couldn't stop the frogs from going into Pharaoh's home. She couldn't stop the frogs from going into Pharaoh's bed. She couldn't stop the frogs from going any and everywhere throughout the land of Egypt. You see, up to this point, the frog was a very revered animal among the Egyptian people, but not anymore. Oh, not after this plague. Now the frog has gone from being revered to being a horror throughout the land. And so God exposed Heket. But, but then we come to the third plague, and that involved lice. Lice coming from the dust of the earth. That's what the Bible tells us in Exodus chapter 8, verses 16 through 17. And that is another very interesting plague because with it, God seems to be sending a shot at the Egyptian god Geb. You see, Geb was the god, according to the Egyptians, who was supposed to be the god of the earth. He was supposed to be the god who created earthquakes. He was supposed to be the god who allowed the crops to grow so the people could eat. Geb was supposed to be the one who controlled the earth, according to the Egyptians. But notice how with this plague, God exposed Geb. With this plague, Geb was exposed to be a phony and a fraud because he couldn't stop the lice from coming from the dust of the earth. In fact, not only was Geb exposed with this plague, but if you remember the story, Pharaoh's magicians were also exposed with this plague, right? If you remember up to this point, Pharaoh's magicians were able to fool him with their magic. They could fool him with their tricks. They could fool him with their sorcery. They could in some way reproduce these wonders that are being performed by the power of God. They could do that up to this point, but they couldn't do it this time. This time, they couldn't reproduce something similar to what was going on. Instead, this time, even they had to admit that the God of the Israelites was, in fact, the one true and living God, and he was at work. And so with this play, God exposed Geb, and he also exposed the magicians of Pharaoh. And then you come to the fourth plague, and the fourth plague was swarms. Swarms. Now, some of your translations may read swarms of flies, though that idea may not be entirely accurate because the word flies is often supplied by the translators. You see, instead of flies, it is more possible that the scarab beetle is under consideration. The scarab beetle was held in high esteem among the Egyptians. In fact, their great god Ammon is often pictured as having the head of a beetle. Many scholars suggest that a plague of beetles, of these kinds of beetles, would have been far worse than a plague of termites. And if you've ever had termites before, you know that termites can do some serious damage, right? T termites are no fun to have in your home, but scholars say that a plague of these kind of beetles would have been far worse than termites. These creatures could have done a whole lot of damage. 
But even if it is flies, if you want to hold to that position, here's the point. The point is Ammon, Ra, or any of the other Egyptian gods, they were powerless in, in helping these people. They couldn't save them from beetles. They couldn't save them from flies. They couldn't save them from anything. In fact, this plague right here is another interesting plague because if you re recall the story, it is right here where God begins to make a distinction. Up to this point, the plagues were affecting everybody. They were affecting the Egyptians, and they were also affecting the Israelites. But starting right here with plague number four, God starts to protect his people. God starts to make sure that the Israelites from here on, they're not going to be affected by the plagues. With this plague right here, God starts to make sure that his people are not impacted negatively as they live in Goshen. And so God exposed the false gods of the Egyptians with the swarms. And then we come to the fifth plague. And the fifth plague was diseased livestock. Diseased horses, diseased cattle, diseased very valuable possessions uh, among the Egyptians. God made sure that all the land animals were, were full of disease and, and pestilence during this time, and this was a shot at at least three Egyptian gods. It was a shot at the god Apis. Apis is represented in their artwork as having, as having the body of a bull. It also was a shot at Hathor. Hathor was the goddess symbolized by a cow. And it was also a shot at the goddess Bast. Bast was the cat goddess of love. You see, since all of these animals, these land animals in Egypt were affected by the, this plague, these gods, Apis, Bast, Hathor, they were exposed as frauds. They were exposed as imaginary. None of them could keep the land animals from getting sick. And then we come to the sixth plague, and the sixth plague had to do with boils. Boils, painful sores that were all over the body, painful sores that affected all of, all of the people and all of the beasts. This was a terrible plague, and this plague exposed three Egyptian gods. It, it exposed Serapis and a god called Ahimotep and Thoth. Serapis, Thoth, and Ahimotep. You see, according to the, the Egyptians, they believed that all those gods were the gods of healing. They believed that all of those gods were the gods of medicine, and yet none of them could heal the Egyptians. None of them could prevent the Egyptians from being stricken with boils. And then you come to the seventh plague, which is hail. Strong and heavy hail that fell from the sky. And this is another very interesting plague because this is the first of the plagues that originated from the sky. This was the first of the plagues that came from above, and this plague was designed to expose two particular Egyptian gods, one named Nut and one named Horus. Nut and Horus, you see, both of those gods were said to be the gods of the sky. Both of those gods were said to have been able to control the things that came from above. But notice how with this plague, God exposed them. God showed that they had no power over the sky at all. They couldn't protect the people from the hail that fell from the sky. They couldn't protect the crops. They couldn't protect the animals. They couldn't protect any of the people in Egypt from what was taking place. And then you come to plague number eight, which was the locust. Locusts, they went throughout the land of Egypt. In Exodus chapter 10, verses 4 through 5, God says that he was going to send locusts throughout the land, and whatever the hell didn't destroy, guess what? The locusts was going to destroy it. They were going to eat everything that remained in the land, and that plague exposed a few different gods. It exposed Nepri, 
and exposed Seth and exposed a God called Thermonusis. You see, all of those quote unquote gods were said to be the gods of crops and grains. They were said to, to be the gods who protected the food that grew from the ground. But during this plague, for some reason, they were silent. They did nothing. They were exposed as frauds and powerless when it came to helping the Egyptians. And then you come to plague number nine, and what is that one? Well, you got darkness going throughout the land, right? Darkness, the whole land of Egypt, except Goshen, where the Israelites live, all of Egypt is dark for three days. In fact, the Bible says that the darkness was so, was so thick and it was so strong that you could even feel the darkness. Can you imagine darkness like that? Darkness so strong that you can even feel the darkness. This plague was another terrible plague, and it exposed the chief Egyptian god. It exposed Amun-Ra. Remember, Amun-Ra was supposed to be the sun god, right? He was supposed to be the supreme god of the Egyptians. He was supposed to be the god who protected the light and made sure that the Egyptians received it every single day. That was Amon Ross. That was supposed to be his responsibility, but where is he at now? Why isn't he doing anything? Why isn't the sun coming out for three days? God exposed him. God exposed him to be a fraud. And then the final plague. Go in your Bible to Exodus chapter 11, please. I want to read this one. Exodus chapter 11, beginning with verse number 4, the death of the firstborn. Exodus 11 and verse number 4, Moses said, Thus says the Lord about midnight, I'm going to go out into the midst of Egypt, and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall, shall die. From the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on his throne, even to the firstborn of the slave girl who is behind the millstones, all the firstborn of the cattle as well, moreover there should be a great cry in all the land of Egypt, such as there has never been before, and such as shall never be again. My dear friends, I want you to imagine living in ancient Egypt 3,500 years ago. You're an Egyptian and you wake up in the middle of the night and you go into the room of your firstborn child only to find that child dead. Only to find your firstborn child dead. Can you imagine having to witness that? Can you imagine having to experience waking up in the middle of the night only to find your firstborn child dead? Can you imagine the horror that was taking place throughout the land of Egypt? This is a terrible thing to consider. And obviously that would be the most devastating blow to the Egyptian people. Obviously, that would be the most devastating blow to Pharaoh, the king of the Egyptians. You see, we got to understand that during this time, the firstborn played a critical role to the family. The firstborn was not only entitled to a double portion of the father's riches, but he was also considered the most important child. He was supposed to be the leader of the family after the death of the father. The firstborn child was considered to be a very important figure in the family. But on this night, all of them died. All of the firstborns throughout the land, they perished and none of their gods could stop it from happening. Ammon Ra couldn't stop it. The sun god couldn't stop it. The fertility gods, the gods who were supposed to protect the children, the gods who were, who were even supposed to be the guardians of life. It didn't matter which god you listed for the Egyptians. None of them could stop what Jehovah did on this night. 
they all were exposed. They were exposed as phonies and frauds. These are the ten plagues that God brought upon the Egyptians. The question, though, is this. What were the Egyptians to learn from all of this? I mean, besides obviously experiencing great pain and suffering, what did God really want these people to know? What did he really want them to understand from these 10 awful plagues he sent upon them? Well, I want to suggest three lessons the Egyptians should have learned from all of this. And the first one is pretty obvious. The first lesson that the Egyptians should have learned from this is they should have learned that God is real. God is legit. God is not like the false gods that they worship. He's not like Ammon Ra. He's not like Geb or Nut or Horus. No, unlike the gods, quote unquote, that they worship, the God of the Israelites, he was the one true and living God. He was Yahweh. He was Jehovah. He was legit and in full existence. That was the main lesson that God wanted the Egyptians to learn. And I want to suggest to you this morning that that's also a lesson that's relevant to us today. That's also a lesson that we need to really understand today. That's also a lesson that we need to constantly keep in the forefront of our mind. My dear friends, as we live in a culture and society today that as each and every year goes by, there are fewer and fewer people believing in God. There are fewer and fewer young people who are believing in God these days. And as we live in a society that shifts towards that direction, we got to make sure that we always remember and that we always teach our children about the time when God manifested himself among the Egyptians. We got to always remember and we got to always teach our children that the same God who brought these 10 plagues upon the Egyptians, he is real and alive today. He is still sovereign today. He is still the creator and the ruler of all things today. These Egyptians should have learned that God, the God of the Israelites, was in fact the one true and living God, and that is something that is going to be a relevant lesson until the Lord comes back. Let's always remember that. There's a lesson here about God's existence. But then secondly, there's also a lesson about God's judgment. There's a lesson here about God's Ability to execute judgment on whomever he desires. Remember what God said here. God said that one of the purpose of these plagues was to execute judgment on the false gods of the Egyptians. God says, I'm going to bring judgment on these false gods through these plagues. But not only did he bring judgment on the false gods through, through these plagues, he also brought judgment on the Egyptian people. He also made sure that they suffered because they rejected him. They were worshiping these false gods. They were rebelling against his will for their lives. God executed judgment against the Egyptian people for rebelling against his will. And we need to understand that that same thing is also going to happen when the Lord comes back like a thief in the night. The Lord is also, when he comes back, he's going to execute judgment against any and everyone who rebels against his will and refuses to acknowledge him as the sovereign God. We see that when we look at what Paul says in the book of 2 Thessalonians. Over in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, listen to what the apostle of God says. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and in verse number 6. In 2 Thessalonians 1 and verse 6, Paul says this, For after all, it is only just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you, and to give relief to you who are afflicted and to us as well, when the Lord will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire. Verse 8, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God, and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus, 
Verse 9, these will pay the penalty of eternal or everlasting destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Notice carefully what Paul says in those verses. Notice how Paul says that when the Lord comes back one day, he's not only going to be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, but he's going to be revealed from heaven dealing out retribution. Dealing out judgment against those who do not know God and don't obey the gospel. Paul says in verse 9 that when Jesus comes back, the wicked, those who've rebelled against God, they're going to receive eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord. In other words, when the Lord comes back, the wicked are going to receive a far worse punishment or judgment than the Egyptians received in the time of Moses. It's going to be everlasting and eternal. And so there's a lesson here about respecting God and fearing God because not only is he a God of love, he's also a God of judgment. But then finally, a final lesson I wanted to take from this account is in addition to learning about God's existence and God's judgment, the Egyptians should have also learned a lesson about God's power. God's power, particularly God's power to protect his people. God's power to protect his people from suffering in the same way that the heathen nations around them suffered. Remember in this story, once we get to the fourth plague, God starts protecting his people. He protects them from the swarms and the locusts and the hail and the boils and the darkness. He even protects their firstborn children. God has the power to protect his people. And that's something we need to especially remember during this time of crisis and pandemic that we're living in today. Let us not forget, my friends, that the one true and living God is still in the business of watching over his people and loving his people and protecting them and helping them endure. God has the power to protect his people, and God also has the power to deliver his people. You see, through God's power that was demonstrated on this occasion, Israel was delivered. They were delivered from Egyptian slavery. They were delivered from several hundred years of, of bondage. It was through God's power that Israel was delivered. And just like God's power delivered his people 3,500 years ago, we need to understand that God's power through his son, Jesus Christ, he has delivered his people today. He has delivered us from the bondage of sin. He has delivered us from the bondage of Satan. He has delivered us from the bondage of a slave master that is far worse than that of Pharaoh. But I just want you to see, my dear friends, that when going against the one true and living God, the gods of the Egyptians didn't have a chance. They didn't have a shot. God easily exposed them as the phony and frauds that they were. The question is, what about you? Who are you serving? Are you serving the gods of this world? The God of greed? The God of worldliness? The God of sexual immorality? Are you serving the gods of this world? Or are you serving the one true and living God? Are you serving Jesus? Are you serving the God who loved you so much that he gave his life on the cross for your sins? If you're not serving the one true and living God, I want to close this lesson by, by trying to urge you as someone who loves you to start serving him right here and right now today. Give your life to him today. If you're not a Christian, believe in, in him. Repent of your sins. Obey his commandment to be baptized in water for the forgiveness of your sins. If you strayed away from giving him your faithful and full service, come back to him and repent before it's everlasting too late. If there's someone here who needs to humble themselves before the one true and living God, you have an opportunity to do so right here and right now as we stand and we sing together.